Today I'm looking at modding another Nintendo classic, this time the Game Boy Advance SP. Hi, welcome back to the shed. This box contains an IPS screen that's designed to fit inside a Game Boy Advance SP. I'm going to take a look at the different variations of the Game Boy Advance, install the kit in an existing console, and I've got a new shell to go on the outside as well, so it should be good fun. The Game Boy Advance, launched by Nintendo in the year 2000, came with a colour screen. However, that colour screen was not front lit, back lit in any way. You needed a good source of light to be able to actually see what was going on on the display. And to be fair, in some games in particular, it was difficult to see what was on there. There was a big demand for Nintendo to release a version that had some form of lighting on the screen. Along came the Game Boy Advance SP. The same display, but there's an overlay with a lit up panel that you can't see very clearly here, but trust me, it does light up. Clamshell form factor made it really, really popular for portable gaming. So although we now had a lit up version, the display still wasn't great. We got stuck with this in the UK and they never came out with any better version. In other territories, however, a new brighter version called the AGS 101, as opposed to the old screen, which was the AGS 001, the fantastic crisp clear backlit screen that had brightness settings by pressing this button here you could change it to an even brighter vibrant display so that was like the ultimate version of the game by advance by that point so although these other territories got this absolutely awesome looking game boy with the backlit screen we in the uk we're still stuck with this as our best option this one that i've got here contains one of the new backlit ips screens and it's really really bright so when those mods came about and I found out you could get an adapter ribbon that this screen could be transplanted into one of these AGS 001 consoles, I had to give it a go. And this was the end result. I got one of these awesome extreme green glow-in-the-dark shells. I kept my original screen lens cover and I put the new screen inside. It involved a little bit of cutting to the shell but not too much and it looked amazing. I mean compare those two, that's just incredible. It looks much much more like the AGS 101. In fact a little bit crisper and a little bit brighter even than that. Now I wouldn't go tinkering about with those, but it's well worth doing the modification to upgrade from one of these front lit screens to one of these incredible backlit screens. And that brings us onto the kit that I'm installing today. Although I've already done this mod, this was with one of the early versions of the IPS screen and it wasn't specifically made for the Advance SP. The display is ever so slightly bigger than the original and that means that by using the original lens there, the image display is slightly cropped. With the kit that I've got to install today, the border around here is slightly bigger, which means we'll be able to see the entire screen. So hopefully that'll go pretty well. So I've got two new kits to look at, the screen display and the outer shell. So I'm gonna put the shell to one side for a moment and we'll start with a look at the actual screen upgrade. So we'll pop that open and take a look at what's inside. Nicely packed, got this one off eBay, delivered from China. So I've been waiting a little while and it turned up this week. Right, so this is the kit. The actual lens is applied onto the screen already. It comes with that attached. Um, looks like it's been applied straight enough, so that's good. Uh, there's a little tab here to attach to this. It attaches here to this adapter PCB, and we've got the ribbon there, which will slot into the motherboard of the Game Boy Advance SP. Now, because we've got metal on the back of here, and we've got metal on the back of the screen, there's also this insulating film which will go onto the back of the screen foam pack out the casing a little bit of what looks like some double-sided tape the wire i didn't actually do it when i did this one i just had it set to full brightness what we're going to do this time is adapt it so that we can use this button here to change the brightness levels that wire will go from here and it will solder onto the motherboard so that we can affect that brightness okay in here I've got my replacement shell and I've gone with the Nintendo Super Famicom style. The top of that looks like the top of the Super Famicom console. And then on the inside, this sort of emulates the controls with the yellow and the red. Uh, and there's also the blue and green on the shoulder button. So I'm really looking forward to getting that one wrapped around this pretty cool screen as well. And this is our donor console. Now I mentioned earlier about the front lit panel and the screen had actually been used for a different project on this one 
and the front light has been removed. It's been on charge for a little while. Hopefully, let's just see, it'll switch on without the power supply. Yeah, so that's all okay. What I'm gonna need to do is dismantle this, remove all the bits that I need. I need the two points from the hinge because they don't come with the separate shell. I need the motherboard, I need the battery, and I need the speaker from the inside. So like a lot of Nintendo's handhelds, we're going to need a tri-wing and a crosshead screwdriver, usually tri-wing to get into the main parts. Uh, there's also a crosshead for the battery cover, and then on the inside, it'll be a couple of crosshead screws. So we'll take that apart. We're going to look at these hinges. So that flips over like this. To remove the ribbon, there's a little section here that comes out with a crosshead screw. So we'll just take that cap off and then it makes it much, much easier for the ribbon to be removed. This is the bit that gives most people grief when uh, taking these apart and it's trying to remove these two hinges. Uh, as a result, what I usually do is I'll, like with the DS that I've done in the past, I'll usually make this my first job before I start messing with anything else. So what I need to do is take these two and push them out and it's easiest to do that when the screen is opened up because the way it slots in is lined up neatly. All I've got to do is try and push it out with a screwdriver normally and I've got these little plastic tabs that need to be moved out of the way as well so it is a bit fiddly. So first job is to try and get all those little tabs, the little plastic tabs out of the way. Once they're all inside the hole, you'll see that the hinge starts to make its way out already. And I'll just be able to push that out with the end of a screwdriver, hopefully. And that just pops out. The two hinges that you've got are different. You've got a left and a right hinge. So it's important that you take, as you're looking at it from the console itself, if you've got your right hinge out, put it somewhere over on the right and then your left hinge, do the same with that over there. Now this one's a little more awkward because it's hard to get in here, but it is doable. First thing I'll do is with it closed, I'll remove the little plastic tabs out of the way. If you accidentally snap one of those plastic tabs, it's unlikely to matter. It's such a secure fit with these hinges anyway that you're unlikely to have any problems there. Whoop, there we go. So that just popped out. If you are planning to get rid of the old shell anyway, sometimes you might find it easier to just take that and just snap it off. Then you can just pull the little hinge brackets out. However, if you manage to bring them out properly, you'll understand how it all fits together a bit better, which makes it easier for when you're putting it together. In here, there's like a particular shape, a particular profile, and there's like two little tabs. And on the hinge itself, there's like two little recesses. So you've just got to make sure everything's lined up. So when the hinge is at, well, when that's at any other angle, it doesn't work. But here you've got two tabs at that point. Here you've got two tabs at a different angle. So what you need to do when you put it together is make sure they're lined up and the new hinge will just slot straight in. A lot of people find the hinges really frustrating with this. But once I understood how they worked, I actually started finding it much, much easier. So I've got my top half and my bottom half there, and that is where I'm going to be putting my hinges. These two caps to go on the end of the hinges. Now again, mold quality is variable on those when you get a repro one, so there's a few bits that will make it difficult to put inside the ends here. So what I'm going to do before I even put the hinges in is I'm going to clean up the edges of those with my knife. Just be careful of your fingers if you're doing that because it's quite small. So they're all a lot cleaner now. There's not going to be any little bits of plastic sort of impeding the movement of the hinges going into place. Seeing as the left side was the more difficult of the two, I'm going to start with that one. These little caps will just slide off. They just sort of slide up, but it's important to put these on here before you put it in. I've made the mistake of doing this in the past and putting the hinges in without the cap on and you just can't get them back in and trying to take these out can be pretty awkward too so that one's ready i'll get the other one ready as well just in case i forget let's just slide the little cap off it can be a little bit awkward but it will come off and put the new one on so that just slides on and that'll hold in place 
then I'll put my console on its side, make sure my tabs are lined up, get my hinge in place and it should just push in. That just pushes in place, going from the other side. Easier to hold it at the right angle now. Get my little cap, make sure I'm lined up correctly and just push that in place. And then where they stick out a little bit, just takes an extra little bit of pressure to move those in. Just check you're not damaging anything in terms of the plastic. Looks to be a bit of a tight fit there. And that side there going in okay. So just push. And if your hinge looks slightly misaligned, just push it into position. It'll make it easier to get these in. If they don't go in, particularly with this one because it looks like it's painted on the top, I wouldn't force it with a screwdriver or anything because you don't want to scratch it. Um, but that is sticking out slightly. So I'll get something that will help me to push that back in if I can. There we go. So that applied a little bit of extra force but wasn't going to scratch the surface. So I've got my little cap in place there, my other little cap in place there. So now the most difficult part of the job is done. That just opens and closes really easily. So that is my recommended method for putting the dreaded hinges in place. Right, so I've zoomed in a bit to try and explain this. So that's my new screen and that is going to fit just here. Now in this part of the shelf at the top half, it fits in quite easily, it just drops into place. This is going to be going in place over here, so we need some clearance along this edge. So I need to remove quite a lot of this strip that goes along around here, but I reckon from where that flips over, so from about here to here, I'll also need to remove that lip. Where we've got those little support struts, one, two, three, four, five, I'll do the area that's between there and there for that um, and also I'll need to remove this whole section here I think from the very top there down to probably about that point there. Right, let's see how that goes. I'm going to try and use some cutters for this rather than the Dremel today, just for a bit of a change. That whole rail's been done and then that section's been lowered off. The insulating film to go on the back, particularly on this section here. on the back there. So that tab clicks in place on here. What I need to do now is flip that over and stick it down. So I'll get the double sided tape ready. So that will flip over here. I need to carefully get my ribbon out of the way. I don't want to put any creases or kinks or tears in that. And then just Let's hit that flat there. You can see it does stick out slightly further than the rest, which is why we needed to remove that bit of plastic before. But that should all be okay. Now before I go peeling off surfaces and things, we'll do a test fit. So the screen all sits on top, but where that's removed, I've cleared enough there for that PCB to go and moving around there it doesn't seem to be putting any excess pressure on anything so that's all safe but I'm not sure if the foam layer would cause problems with pressure on this bit let's have a look it sits okay but it puts a bit of pressure on the board there and then that can sit there and even things out hopefully we can peel off 
this protective layer from the front of the lens now. It's a glass lens in this one as well, so hoping that will look really nice. Drop it neatly in place. Everything should be lined up perfectly simply just because of the shape of it there. What I'm going to need to do now is position my ribbon that will loop over there and through here like that. Let's come out the other side. This fits over here. It's neatly on there. I'm not going to screw that in place until I know everything else is correct. I've put a tiny dot of solder on the solder point there. I did my wire, had that going out at an angle there. Now it's time to try and get this all attached. The two bits of plastic are raised. Line up my ribbon. You can't see this, so I'll just tilt up. I've Bed it in there and now I'm going to try carefully to pull those tabs in while it's in place. So that's just about got the tab in place there. Don't even know if that's focused there. So my wire from here needs to loop around and go to a point there that's marked as Q12B. I'll just Add a little flux. You can, if you haven't got flux, you can do this just with the solder. Most modern solder has flux built into it anyway. So that's the point there. My wire needs to come around from here, across there to this point. So it needs to be that long. Strip the end off. Okay. A bit of solder on the wire. Like I did with the other point, if I want it neat, I'll just cut that wire shorter. And I'm not going to loop it all around, I'm just going to reach right across so I've got a bit more room to move. Now that that's soldered in place, I can use tweezers or a spudger to just root the wire so it's not going to bump into anything else as it goes around to the point where we need it on the ribbon there. Let's loop that around here. Uh, remember to put the speaker back in. Speaker sits there. Buttons in place. Now that trigger buttons L and R are actually already in place on the back bit there so it's just these two pins I'll need to drop in so I don't need to worry about that for this part of the operation um, but what I haven't done yet and what I just remembered actually before I put that in is to put this um, cap part in place so that was from the old one this is my new one that is going to sit here like that just get that into place the screw to hold that is the longest one so you've got all sorts of different screws in here it's a cross head it's quite a long screw and I'll just carefully get that into the plastic there so cutting a new thread in so if ever you've got a brand new one Remember that there's not a thread in there already. When you're putting a new screw in, do like a half turn in, quarter turn out, and keep doing that over and over. And it will cut that nice and neatly without the top of the screw stripping or anything like that. Right, so now we can do this. Uh, we'll take our motherboard, flip it over, drop it in position. 
position. I've got one, two, three screws to go in here. Uh, they again are crosshead screws. And again, it's a, a fresh hole, so I'll go in, I'll keep going in and back out. Just like a side to side wiggle on the screwdriver, just helps to cut the thread neatly. It makes it less likely to burst out as well. It's not going to put any undue strain on the plastic. Obviously, with all these things, never over tighten the screws once they feel like they're in. Don't be tempted to give it that final little nip because that's when they can burst out the top and ruin your whole console. So that's one, two, three of those in place. Okay, so the on off switch has got like a little bump there. The bump needs to be facing upwards. So I'll just drop that in there, leave it in the off position. Right, so the back is all good to go. That's ready for going together. But before you put the back on, one thing to watch out for is this, the battery cover that goes there. Um, has a screw that goes in place so what you need actually is a little metal part on the inside there metal square there so before I put it back together that needs to just sit in place here I'll push in place there and then we'll put the top on I've got my power switch in place with the little clip facing upwards everything else there is okay I'll just slot on Make sure that you are lined up carefully at the top with your L and R buttons. They might need a bit of a wiggle to get them lined up properly. There we go, that'll just snap in. Check all the way around before you put your screws in. Right, so for screwing together the top there, rather than the cheap screws that came with the kit, I fortunately had some spares left over from doing Nintendo DS lights and there's some nice short screws that went in place easily there. I've now got these little rubber bits um, to go in place. They don't look like they're self-adhesive. I think they just drop straight into the hole, which is fine by me because it'll make it easier to take them back out if I ever need to. If you're having trouble working them in, you can always use like the end of a spudger just to guide them like that particularly if you've got no fingernails. The sticker goes on this area at the back here. Funnily enough, it says model number AGS001. Well, it's not a 001 or a 101. Finishing touch. Make sure we get it the right way around. A little Nintendo badge. That sits flat in there. And then these have like a little clear layer over the top. So I'll just peel that off as well. And then you've got a nice shiny finish. So we've got our Super Nintendo. Came by Advance SP. With that awesome new screen in place. With the green and the blue and the A, B in red and yellow. All of it. That's really, really nice. Slots in easily. Switch on. So let's try our different brightnesses. Make that nice and bright. Use our English language. And there we go. That is awesome one of the games i always use for testing out any game Boy advanced projects is the uh, street fighter 2 because once it's on there is the opportunity to go into the sort of practice mode and you can try out all your different moves which allows you to try out all your different buttons so if we go on start there oh, this does look good uh, go into training Do you know, it's, it's funny, it's only very, very slight difference in size, but it makes a huge difference. Let's just turn the volume down so you can hear me chatting on. So if I look at the one that I did last time and the, the border on that one, it's, it's like a millimeter all the way around. So you wouldn't think it'd make much of a difference. 
But when I'm looking at this here, it just looks amazing. <laughs> it looks really, really good. Right, so um, volume up a bit so we can hear. Select makes the sound. Start pauses it. Um, left, right, up, down. See, it's a really good game for testing all these buttons. A, B, R, and L. Everything's working perfectly. All right. Welcome to my favourite Game Boy Advance SP. That is so nice. Cool. Right, I wasn't quite sure what to expect from that backlight kit, but really it was super easy to do. Much, much easier than the last time I did it when I was trying to make do with my own lens. It came with the glass lens already attached to the top of the screen and it's lined up perfectly. I didn't even have to worry about any of that. Cutting out the bits from the plastic. Last time I did it, when I used this one, it was tricky because it's a clear shell. So when you're cutting out bits from the inside of a clear shell, you're going to be able to see that from the outside. So this time when I did it, I did it with an opaque one, which meant that you can't see any evidence of the cut in there. It looks really, really neat. The Super Famicom style case looks brilliant the quality of the screen is just jaw-dropping i'm looking forward to playing a bit of metroid on that later um but yeah it, it's turned out so well i know there were a few hiccups along the way because i was kind of fumbling my way through it like i always do um but i'm going to order a few more of those kits i've got a box of a whole load of graveyard of Game Boy Advance SP so I should be able to build two or three more out of the spare parts I've got. I'm um, looking forward to it. It was a really fun project to do so I hope you learned a little bit from it. If you fancy trying it out I'd say give it a go. I would definitely recommend getting the SP specific kits um, but yeah it was good fun. So there we go another Game Boy project in the bag. I hope you enjoyed watching and I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.